the stability of the pot. And um, when I flew KC-10s out in California, we actually had a couple of kills. <coughs> we, um, where we, we lost a couple of receiver aircraft where the basket um, uh, either was, was moving too quickly or more often uh, with inexperienced receiver pilots, they don't hit the basket just right. They, they, um, they, they hit it too hard. The take-up reel, that when the basket hits into the, when the probe hits into the basket, um, a little bit of force, the take-up reel inside the system adjusts for it and comes in and then it eventually goes out. If it hits it too hard, it can't adapt it. What happens is you get a kind of an S sine wave and then that comes back. And when it comes back, it whips uh, and sometimes it'll snap the probe right off. When in my squadron at March Air Force Base, we had that happen with an A-4 in the Pacific and the fuel that came out when that, ha when that uh, happened went into a vent behind the pilot's um, uh, cockpit, and the vent went into the engine, uh, boom. Uh, and, and the next thing we knew, there was a parachute coming down. So you do have occasionally incidents with these, with, uh, with the drogue systems. I, I will say they're rare, but occasionally you will see that happen. By the way, the same thing happens with a boom. Occasionally when you have a, um, um, it is inherently dangerous. So you have a situation where the two aircraft become unstable, uh, and uh, you can have a, um, a <coughs> nozzle break off into the, the receiver URC or some sort of accident uh, situation. It, it, it's very rare, I will say this, it's very rare, but it does occasionally happen. And, you know, we've been talking from a pilot's perspective. I want to go back to um, the, the aerial refueling system operator's perspective. So this is a, a legacy system. Um, we saw in the, um, in, uh, the video earlier, they were looking on, on sort of a monitor system. Um, this is actually what we're about to see is a, um, a U.S. Uh, Air Force personnel who is serving on a, an exchange tour with the Royal Australian Air Force operating uh, the system and showing both the, how it works for the hose and drogue and also for the boom. Remember contact check this to the line complete. We're currently on the KC-38 multi-role tanker transport aircraft, and we just refueled the E-7 wedge jet for the first time on operations in the Middle East. We'll wait for the receiver call, stable ready, and we'll clear to contact. As the wedge jet approaches the KC-30, our first objective is to obtain visual contact with the receiver. Once we ascertain that, we'll make verbal contact with the receiver and coach them into the astern position, which is 50 feet after the air refueling boom, and then guide the receiver aircraft into the contact position through a set of lights underneath the KC-30A. At that point, we will maneuver the boom into the receptacle. Once it makes a solid and effective contact, it will start the transfer of fuel to the receiver aircraft. Forward. The major significance of the Royal Australian Air Force KC-30A to be able to refuel the E-7 wedge tail is increased flexibility in the area of operations. It allows us to refuel our own aircraft and provide that aviation fuel to increase the effectiveness of the RAF and ADF in the theater. Approaching halfway through the scheduled upload. It's a great honor to fly with the Royal Australian Air Force for three years. It's also a great honor to be a part of this first time event for the Royal Australian Air Force, in particular our squadron. In the middle of that video, um, you may have seen an image that um, that looked like a, a uh, basically a very blurry display. The reason for that is that unlike the uh, the camera that was filming this, the operator is wearing special 3D glasses. This is actually uh, on our um, enhanced vision system for uh, the A330 MRTT, um, a a 3D vision system. There are multiple cameras on the tail of the aircraft and it produces that overlay so that the, um, the refueling operator has the same depth of field as the operator looking out a window at an actual aircraft instead of looking through a camera system. Um, the other advantage of having a camera system, of course, is that it gives you uh, both day and night uh, capability. And these are images taken from our camera system of the same receiver aircraft in day operations and in, uh, in night operations. And the final thing I'll ask about, and then we'll open it to, to Q&A, is we talked about, uh, as we talked about night operations, all the video we saw was nice weather days, clear, sunny skies. Um, you have to operate in, at night. You have to operate in bad weather. 
um, you have to operate sometimes in lightning. Um, and you guys have shared some sort of hairy stories with me. Um, Tim, have you ever uh, been in an electrical storm uh, trying to pass highly combustible fuel to an aircraft? Yeah, my first my first couple of tours were in the southeast. Um, I, I was uh, in, in Seymour Johnson uh, and Barksdale, uh, both in KC-135s and Seymour Johnson, as well as KC-10s, and then Barksdale uh, in Louisiana in, in KC-10s. And uh, during the summer, a lot of thunderstorms, a lot of electrical activity in the air. And so, um, as a receiver pilot, you would often, you'd see the flickers coming off the boom, you'd see uh, say almost fire up around the, the, uh, the cockpit. Uh, very frightening. Um, uh, I, I will say this, though, for, for night operations. The good thing about flying at night, particularly after midnight or so, it's, it's air is relatively stable at that point. Usually things have calmed down, cooled off. <coughs> air is pretty stable, so night refueling in stable weather, is a little bit challenging but kind of fun. Anytime you're refilling in turbulence, it's no fun. And at night in turbulence, where you have restricted visibility and turbulence, that's that's the opposite of fun. I don't know what you'd call that. Really, really not fun. It's uh, it, and it's quite quite frightening. But of course, these missions call for it sometimes. You know, you when you fly an operational mission, and we've all flown them, um, the weather is not perfect. Uh, uh, you have to overcome it. You have to deal with electrical stuff going on outside the aircraft, and sometimes as it bounces inside the aircraft, that same almost fire, those, those things, um, you just kind of have to uh, screw up your courage and go do it. So. And Max, you've done that in a C-5, which is the largest aircraft in the, the DOD inventory. Um, you were talking a little bit about the disorientation uh, that can become a factor. Yeah, it's, it's not uncommon at night uh, as a receiver to be completely disoriented. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when you're coming into the contact position, you don't use instruments inside your cockpit, and you basically have no reference to the ground. So you're flying now essentially off the horizon that is the tanker aircraft. <coughs> so as you might imagine, uh, if you're looking at the attitude uh, direction indicator, the ADI, within the cockpit of your aircraft, you have a sort of a little aircraft image on that ADI. Now that little aircraft image that is your artificial horizon, or, uh, becomes the big airplane now out in front of your window. At night, all you see is the fuselage. The wings are ultimately, you might see a, a flashing light, but typically they turn those down or even off during the refueling process so as not to blind you or to give you false horizons. So it's completely disorienting in many cases. During the weather, it's even worse. You might have a lightning flash off to one side or another. You don't know if that's the wingtip light or in fact lightning, and it's, it is very disorienting. And so many times, uh, when in contact, you're looking at what you think is a, a, a relatively straight and level flying aircraft. He may be in a turn, and when they do the turns, the tanker is doing it very slowly and very carefully because he doesn't want you to fall off and want you to get to gas. But it's, again, very disorienting. So you may be in a 30-degree left-hand bank. You may feel on the seat of the pants like you're in a 60-degree right-hand bank. It's, it's extraordinarily uncomfortable but you don't have a choice. You have to stay in contact, you've got to get your fuel. Uh, my most disorienting experience was with the President's helicopters and limousines and a communications package in the back of the C-5. Had a very full, very heavy airplane, 19.2 hours nonstop from Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland to Osaka, Japan. Two KC-10s that met us over top of Alaska en route, and we had to refuel off of both airplanes, took 90,000 pounds of fuel from one, left it, went over to the other one, took 90,000 pounds of fuel from the second one. By the time I got to the second KC-10, I had no idea whether I was right side up, upside down, not a clue. Uh, it didn't matter. I plugged in, got the gas, and when we finally left, I literally gave the airplane the co-pilot, went to the back and laid down for a little while because I was so completely lost as to whether I was, you know, level, upside down, right side up, I had no idea. No horizon, completely clouded, evening, no sun, no night, you know, no, no light at all, no stars, nothing. Um, again, very disorienting, but it's part of flying the aircraft and part of flying two airplanes in close vertical proximity, so. And, and the reason that, uh, in particular, we wanted to share these stories is that, you know, we're in the business of thinking and talking about commercial aviation, com competitive discriminators in commercial aircraft, which are inherently based on things like efficiency, fuel efficiency, operational efficiency, operational readiness. All of those are unquestionably, you know, as Larry was pointing out, extremely important in military aviation. 
There's another element to it as well, though, which is that inherent danger in the mission that these aircraft are doing. And so as we think about you know, the difference between one type of aircraft and another in doing this mission, the, the systems that are, are really um, coming into play in, in, in truly life and death uh, situations on a fairly routine basis. And so that considerably ups the stakes on how important a small competitive difference between one aircraft and another might be. Um, so why don't we go ahead and uh, open it up to, uh, to questions now uh, from the audience. Um, and I think we have a couple of uh, handheld mics we can pass around per usual. If I could ask for some assistance with uh, some mic runners. Quentin, could I uh, steal you to be a mic runner? <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, Sylvia, back corner. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Test, test. Uh, thank you. Um, Sylvia Five from the FT. I just had a couple of questions. You talked about 14 squadrons. I just wondered what does that mean in terms of, sort of actual numbers for the initial requirement um, from the US government? And have you got any details of your partnership yet with Lockheed Martin? Thank you. So, so as to the numbers, uh, it's generally 14 aircraft per squadron. So, uh, and uh, if they get all 14. I won't do the math in public, but uh, it's 14 I'll, I'll aircraft. Do that one. <laughs> Thank you. And in terms of uh, the agreement, um, nothing's changed since when we put the announcement out on December 4th. You know, this is essentially at this point just an agreement to explore options. Uh, the customer has indicated a potential market for capability, whether that's via a fee for service uh, type model, as was sort of articulated in the RFI in June or whether that's a more traditional you know, procurement model in, uh, in the out years. Um, all we're doing at this point is getting two companies together that have deep experience with aerial refueling capability and deep experience with servicing the needs of the U.S. Air Force and bringing them together to say, let's study the possibilities. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just, I'd just take that a little bit further. I know the agreement also called, you, uh, called for a um, you to conceptualize a, a vehicle or a tanker, uh, essentially. What, what does that, does that mean actually come up with a derivative, potentially a derivative of the, the current um, MRTT that Airbus um, offers? Or are you talking about, you know, perhaps a next generation vehicle beyond that? Is this something a nearer term rather than a far term option? Well, it, it, uh, I think the language of the release used was, you know, conceptualizing the tanker of the future. And what that really means is that, you know, while there's been speculation about follow-on programs to KCX, there isn't an existing requirement. So there's uh, no sort of a, a, a KCY capability document. There's nothing that spells out what the Air Force might, um, in future years or future decades, imagine that they want their aerial refueler to be. Um, so, so it's difficult to speculate on, on whether it could be an MRTT, which you know meets all of all of the requirements of you know the, the previous program and, and all the, the programs of the other countries that are operating it. It has about 80% market share, 85% I think market share outside of the U.S. Um, but it's keeping our options open. I mean, it's you know again at this stage, it's just saying let's position ourselves so that um, if and when in the future the Air Force articulates a specific requirement we're ahead of the game and being ready to respond to that. Because a quick follow-up on that, the uh, Lockheed's outlined a, a hybrid wing body um, tanker, which the Air Force was quite interested in um, as a concept. Could you envisage in the future that you know, Lockheed and Airbus might be able to take that sort of concept forward as a, a further off part of this? Or am I, is that really too far out there? <laughs> Well, you know, again, in the absence of, of a specified requirement, um, you know, any potential option is, is difficult to, uh, to speculate on. Um, you know, under the, you know, if you look at the requirements that are uh, stated in the RFI back in June, looking at commercial refueling options for uh, short-term needs, you know, those are very, what you might consider conventional options. Um, could a KCY or a KCZ be a less conventional design? Sure, it, it could be potentially. And, you know, again, that's where you get into the experience and, and the depth of knowledge of the companies. Um, you know, Lockheed, as you know, it has uh, all of that experience with, you know, low observability going back to, you know, the, the pioneering days at Skunk Works. Um, we have the, the depth of experience on the aerial refueling side, and so it positions us well for being able to respond to uh, whatever might come down the road. 
Any questions? Yes, sir. Hello, uh, Luis Carlos from Prime News. Um, going again with the new program, uh, if Airbus uh, will go to the south, the, the contract, when will the aircraft be converted? In Spain or here in the States? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, and the second one is um, when, we, when you speak about a new generation of a tanker, you're speaking uh, about, uh, for example, a 350 tanker, MRTT, or you are speaking about uh, an aircraft like the Stingray from Boeing. So uh, I'll sort of take those in the two parts. You know, as far as uh, any discussion of where or if tankers might be built, it's it's far too premature to uh, to be able to speak about that. You know, again, we don't have a program of record from the Air Force at this point, hence we don't have a sense of scope. Um, you know, we have said and uh, you know said initially when the announcement was made that you know, we envision that any sort of a requirement would require new build MRTTs. Um, but there's no way to know at this point what kind of quantities we could be speaking about and therefore what the business cases would be associated with uh, with manufacturing. Um, in terms of you know type of aircraft, and again, that goes to, to Guy's question, um, what we see in the RFI right now calls for a very conventional set of capabilities. In fact, I think it, it even specifies um, that uh, it's you know comparable to what they have in inventory right now. Um, it... it uh, it calls for determining the feasibility and capability of a commercial outlet to augment our current air refueling capability um, and a fairly modest number of hours as well. So in the short term, um, those capabilities can be met with, uh, with what we have in the A330 multi-role tanker transport. And again, when you start thinking about future concepts for the Air Force, that's really up for the Air Force to determine. If they set down a requirement, then um, you know, at that point we would evaluate it and what the right solution would be. Mr. Hamilton. Scott Hamilton with William News. Well, 14 squadrons times 14 aircraft is 196 aircraft. And you're talking about a commercial lease type of a deal. That seems like it'd be a heck of a lot of aircraft sitting around for not a lot of hours, perhaps. Um, I have a hard time seeing where the business case to Airbus and Lockheed might be for that. I'm curious, when you say uh, looking at a commercial lease deal, what, uh, where did you derive that from? Well, it's a fee, a fee basis. This, this RFI is a fee basis type of thing. Uh, and so that struck me as an, um, an Omega Air type of commercial deal or a uh, lease deal I could do with, with uh, the UK. Uh, unless I misunderstand that. Yeah, uh, well, so you didn't on the RFI, but I think it's important to note, and, and the Air Force is best positioned to, to comment on this, but there were two separate and independent things that happened. One was the RFI in June that outlined um, some sort of, uh, you know, again, um, commercial outlet to augment current air refueling capability and initially in excess of 7,000 hours uh, annually. Separate from that was the Secretary of the Air Force statement in September of 2018 about the need for an additional 14 squadrons. Those two, again, it's for the Air Force to speak to, but we're not interpreting that as being the same thing. Um, could there be some overlap in that? Yes, certainly there could be. But, but I don't think, and again, not to speak for the Air Force, but I don't think it's accurate to interpret 14 additional squadrons as being fee for service for 14 additional squadrons or 196 aircraft. Does that clarify? Yeah. Other questions? All right. Okay, well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I know that you don't want to really talk about the competition. So I'm going to try to frame this in a way that you don't do that. <laughs> I wasn't aware we had any competition. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, 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 your friends in Seattle have just delivered the first of its airplanes to the Air Force, but they continue to have problems with the, the visual um, way to connect the boom to the, to the airplanes. Your, your videos here show that you've mastered that. As somebody who follows commercial, not military, I'm curious as to, to 
why you succeeded and the other guy still has problems. And, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to, to entice you into dissing somebody. I just don't understand. Yeah. You know, it, it's a difficult question to answer only because, you know, we're neither in a position to have insight into anyone else's system or to comment on anyone else's system. Um, I, I think, though, Tim, maybe you can just speak to sort of the, some of the flexibility that, that you're referencing in the system in the MRTT, independent of anyone else's <coughs> offering. You know, I, I was on the tanker capture uh, with EADS North America for from 2005 to 2011. So I, for six years, I was on that program. And during those six years, we upgraded our visual system numerous times. We started out with the black and white system, and by the time we, w we had our proposal submitted, we had a color 3D system that was high HD. We, f we, we followed the, the technology that was rapidly progressing. Every, it seems like every six months, new cameras, new capabilities. And we quickly inserted those into our proposal. Um, that's one of the beauties, by the way, of, of this railroad concept and its software-based primarily, is that you can rapidly update it. So I think that's the reason why our system worked very well, was our, our, I think our engineering um, people were, were flexible enough to follow the technology and adaptive enough to take advantage of what was out there. Uh, and I saw remarkable progress over those. I mean, I, the black and white system, when I first joined the system, that watered my eyes. I thought that's the greatest thing since... But two years later, I thought, my God, uh, what, what rapid growth and everything. And again, the color 3D system that we proposed to the Air Force was a, was a magnificent system. And I think the one that's on the airplanes we're delivering now are actually better. So I can speak for, for Airbus and our system and say that uh, our engineers are adaptive, uh, they're, they're following the technology, and I think um, it speaks highly to, uh, to how they, uh, they are approaching this particular issue. Guy? Yeah. Just shout it out. Yeah. You, you kind of won this round once, you know, with AC45, um, essentially. It, what sort of lessons learned from that whole experience uh, would you potentially bring to, to this as a real requirement? And sort of why would you win this time round, you know, having actually your first win over to Is it sort of what, what would make it? You know, I would characterize it this way. We, uh, we made two promises during the, um, the tanker campaign, the, the KCX campaign, both of which were contingent upon our winning the contract. The first promise we made was that we were going to uh, build large aircraft at a new manufacturing facility on U.S. soil, specifically in Mobile, Alabama. Um, we lost KCX. We are, this week, breaking ground on our second large aircraft manufacturing facility on U.S. soil in Mobile, Alabama. The second promise we made was that we would be able to aerial refuel um, U.S. combat aircraft sooner than a competitor. We lost the contract, and we've been refueling U.S. combat aircraft uh, in, with our aircraft in the hands of our allies since uh, 2014. Um, I, I would add to that too, you know, when you talk about um, our uh, competitive prospects, the uh, largest program in terms of number of platforms that we have with the U.S. Department of Defense is the UH-72A Lakota helicopter that you'll see tomorrow in Columbus, Mississippi. They've delivered 423 <coughs> and counting of those aircraft uh, over a period of about, uh, I want to say, uh, 12 years and change now. Um, those of you who followed DOD will arch an eyebrow when I say that every one of those aircraft, every one of them has been delivered on time and on 